Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we'd like to introduce you to some of the great work being done by folks using the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially scholars who have received support from the Hagley Center. One such scholar joining me today is Dr. Patricia Curtin, professor at the University of Oregon, and we'll be discussing her book project tentatively titled Working Relationships, a labor-centric history of the U.S. public relations profession. Patricia, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Let's start by painting with broad strokes. What is it you're researching and writing about? This is always the hardest part for me, because what I'm looking at is the intersection of public relations and labor relations. And it's interesting because the two develop very much in conjunction with each other, but neither one talks about the other. Labor relations histories don't mention public relations. Public relations histories don't mention labor. It's like it's the dirty little secret the other has. <laughs> and so your project aims to bring these things into conversation with one another? That's what I'm working on. Uh, it's interesting because when I first started in on this line of research about six years ago, I put in a conference paper and got the reviews back and they came back with only one comment. Labor isn't public relations. You need to learn what public relations is. And so since then, of course, we've had the wave of unionization with Starbucks, et cetera. And mm -hmm. folks are now starting to see that the two really are intertwined. But I like to look at my project a little bit like I remember when I think I was in eighth grade when D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee came out. And I read that book and said, wait a minute, there's a whole nother side of this history here I had never heard about. Mm -hmm. A whole nother way of looking at what happened during the expansion of Western settlers into the West. And I like to kind of think of my project that way. I'm taking a look at what's been done in public relations history, but giving it a very different perspective. And that perspective emphasizes the ties with labor or privileges the labor perspective. How are you handling that? Sure. So there's one chapter that simply looks at how public relations, employee relations, my own professional background was in employee relations, which is part of how I got interested in this. Mm -hmm. So how did that develop in terms of industrial relations? How, when did employee relations and human relations split? So you can see that they actually were intertwined very early on, starting with the mill girls up in New England, where the original work was really in women's departments. It was to protect women who, and in fact, prepare them to be housewives, which would be their true career once mm -hmm. they left the mills and the factories. Then it became more of a function of trying to Americanize immigrants during the large immigration waves. How do we turn these people into what we see as good Americans? And I guess one of the best examples of this is Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. which had a whole public relations department which looked at education as being the way to make this happen. We could educate these people into the ways of capitalism, et cetera, and they would hold a big graduation ceremony where these workers would march in in their native garb into a huge melting pot and then march back out the other side dressed in American clothing and waving American flags. So it was very much this indoctrination. And then it changed again with lobbying for the Taft-Hartley Act, et cetera. So I can go down a lot of rabbit holes here. But in fact, there has been very much this, how do we separate out in an organization who's doing what? And how do we even recognize the fact that labor unions themselves have had wonderful public relations practices, which have been ignored? If you look at Mother Jones, she was a one person public relations machine with what she did with her, things like the Children's March, et cetera, to bring attention to the issues. And to sway public opinion in favor of this movement. Exactly. And so a lot of this came about starting in the progressive era when you start getting a lot of what's 
the import of public opinion, trying to get public opinion on your side. And so a lot of the work that I was doing at Hagley was for a particular chapter of the book, looking at early work that Ivy Lee, who's considered often the father of public relations in this country, did for the anthracite operators during the coal strike of, 19, well, it wasn't a strike in 1906. It was only a suspension of work. But because the 1902 coal strike had been so devastating to the company and public opinion had not been with the coal operators, they decided to try out this new public relations service and see what it could do for them. And so what the Hagley provided was a wonderful set of records from these railroad companies that were operating the coal mines to show their perspective, where they were coming from and what they were trying to accomplish. Well, let's unpack that a little bit further. Um, what collections specifically were you looking at uh, in the Hagley archives? Sure, when I first looked at uh, coming to Hagley, I identified 431 file boxes I'd like to look at. <laughs> Obviously, in a week, I only managed a very small sample. So what I was looking at this trip mainly concentrated on the Reading Railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the railroads that were involved in that 1902 and 1906 labor actions. I also managed to dip a slight toe into the National Association of Manufacturers they play a huge role in this, particularly in later chapters that I'm working on, and also a little bit into Bethlehem Steel. They also hired Ivy Lee to work for them. And so there's a great connection and thread that runs through there. But for the most part, I was in those railroad files and part of me really wished I was a forensic accountant. I think there was so much more I could have gotten out of it had I been able to read those uh, numbers and ledgers even more carefully. Mm -hmm. it, it is just an incredibly rich collection at Hagley. Now, who was this Ivy Lee fellow? Could you perhaps uh, explain where he's coming from? Sure. Ivy Lee was the son of a minister. He was born in Georgia and he went on to become educated at Princeton and then went to New York and worked as a newspaper reporter. <clears throat> so he worked for a number of the major New York papers, but he had a young family, reporting didn't pay very well. And so he decided to try instead, start what was becoming a trend, which was to do publicity work as it was known then. But he tried to set himself up a little bit differently to say, I'm not trying to get free advertising for anybody. What I'm trying to do is give reporters the information they need to write their stories. And having been a reporter, I know how that works. Mm -hmm. And so he set himself up in business. He had a partner, but he was always very attracted to wealth and power. Uh, he saw that as just being kind of the ultimate and the, the American dream come to life. Mm -hmm. And so when very early on in this practice, he was approached by the anthracite uh, road operators to do work for them. Well, <clears throat> who's behind those road operators but JP Morgan? It doesn't get more rich and powerful than that. So I imagine that for Ivy Lee, this was really a big coup to land this client, especially so early on in his business. He had only been doing this for about two years. Mm. And so this was kind of his entree into the world of the big industrialists at the time. And he ended up working for a number of them. Uh, swap with Bethlehem Steel, John D. Rockefeller with the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. So you've got, he starts him on this path where he becomes one of the bigger names in business. Now, unfortunately, he also went on and worked with I.G. Farben. And during the start of World War II, of course, the links to Nazi Germany came out. And he died of that time kind of in disgrace because of his work there hmm. but for the most part he's looked at as really having started public relations which is a little bit of a misnomer in fact there were other folks doing it some of them doing it a bit before he was but he was the one who really kind of made it in with american business and really kind of elevated what was then the very nascent public relations profession hmm. 
Well, what were some of his techniques that proved so effective? He, he put out an incredible amount of information. Um, the work that he did for the coal operators, some of the papers who got his releases, his statements, you know, complained about the fact that they were just overwhelmed with all this <laughs> stuff. And very early on, you can see what he's doing is he's taking a lot of reports and he's stuffing these statements with statistics, a lot of facts and figures. And in fact, later he backed off on some of that because it was just too much. You could see newspapers trying to fit four column tables in their little newspaper <laughs> columns and it wasn't working very well. But he tried to, he uh, really kept a pulse on what was being said in the papers. He would respond to that um, during the 1906 issue with the coal operators. Uh, he put out a number, he, uh, collected how many, what was the sum total of savings in the savings banks in the coal regions? Oh, look, there's so much money being saved. Obviously, the miners are well paid. He then looked at the number of saloons operating in the coal regions and said, hey, look, there are so many saloons per person. You don't have the money to drink unless you're well paid. And so it was interesting, you know, how he tried to use all these statistics to make the case. Mm -hmm. uh, by sort of underlining what economists today might refer to as knock-on effects. Exactly. But the other issue was he was hired in large part because during the 1902 coal strike, the head of the anthracite operators, George Baer, who was president of the Reading Railroad, wrote a letter that has become quite famous and gave Bear the name of Divine Right Bear, because a gentleman wrote to him and said, look, you know, this coal strike is really hurting the country. Can't you budge? Can't you, you know, agree to arbitrate with the miners? And Bear wrote back basically saying that God had given these properties into the hands of Christian men, and it was basically their divine right, but that they would then take good care and stewardship of it. And boy, the it's stated by some, and in fact, it's stated in public relations history that that is the only statement Bear ever made to the press, which isn't true. In fact, Bear did make other statements to the press, and Bear did not release that to the press. That got leaked out. I haven't mm -hmm. quite been able to find the exact chain, but it came out about four weeks after Bear wrote it. Mm -hmm. And the public reaction to that, as you can imagine, was just horrendous. And even four years later, during the 1906 suspension of work in the coal regions, when Ivy Lee is called in to deal with it, folks are still referring to divine right bear and saying, mm -hmm. you know, well, thankfully, this time, God doesn't seem to be getting involved in the action. <laughs> Well, then how did the efforts of someone like Ivy Lee and the coal operators triangulate with this labor perspective and the labor history you're trying to bring to bear on the story? So a lot of this had to do with trying to suppress the union. The coal operators did not want the United Mine Workers of America in their shops. And in fact, in 1906, it's thought that after the 1902 strike where it had gone on for months, President Teddy Roosevelt had to get involved. Um, it actually brought the country almost to a standstill because it was going into winter. People couldn't heat their homes. Mm -hmm. They couldn't cook their food. Schools were shutting down, factories were shutting down. So when 1906 came along and they knew that they'd be negotiating a contract again, the operators stockpiled coal. They had so much coal stockpiled, they could last for months without mm -hmm. an issue. They built stockades around the collieries so that they could bring in substitute workers and protect them with the armed guards they brought in. You had the Coleman <clears throat> Iron Police operating who were basically just hired thugs who would uh, protect the collieries. So they had everything set up for a long strike so that they could weather it, they could keep the public in coal, which had been the big issue against them in 1902. And 
there is a lot of thought then that that was their goal was to break the union, to keep the union from ever getting really established in the anthracite region. It had been established in the bituminous coal fields out in Western Pennsylvania, the Midwest, et cetera, mm -hmm. but to keep them out of the anthracite fields and really to protect, to keep government out of business and to keep organized labor out of business. Mm -hmm. They wanted business to be very much laissez-faire capitalism and kept private. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep public opinion in line uh, unless, uh, in order to avoid those kind of threats. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, very much what they were trying to do. Not that the operators had cared so much about public opinion, but I think, and again, I don't have any hard evidence of this, but triangulating, it seems to be looking more like J.P. Morgan understood mm -hmm. the importance. And mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan definitely pulled the strings. That was one of the wonderful pieces of information that I found in the Hagley files was a unpublished biography, autobiography from Joseph Harris, who had been president of the Reading before George Bear. And George Bear had worked for Harris. And one day they, Harris gets called into JP Morgan's office and there's Bear standing there. He has no idea why Bear is there, but JP Morgan informs Harris, hey, you're not president anymore. This guy is. And just to realize how much Morgan was involved in making sure that what he wanted to happen happened. Wow. Now, the other piece of the story that I, as you were sort of framing your larger project that sounded really interesting was the long-term success that labor unions had in shaping public opinion. Could you perhaps uh, go into some more detail about that? Yeah, that's part that I'm still researching. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, a little shakier ground here. But if you look at, um, especially during the, um, the teens, uh, a lot of labor unrest, a lot of labor movement. Uh, but you get, like I said, Mother Jones, who for the miners was really a one woman public relations machine. Mm -hmm. And she brought so much um, public understanding to what the miners and their families were going through. Uh, and, you know, she did it through what we would now today call a publicity stunt, you know, the staged event. And yet it was very effective at the time. Hmm. And then you look at the uh, Wobblies, the International Workers of the World and their little red songbook. Well, those songs, they've, they've stayed with us. They're incredibly important to making the issues of the labor movement known. Now, I also have a uh, public relations career book from the 1960s, which you know was handed out to college students. If you're thinking of a career, here's public relations and you read through it, it says, and by the way, unions have public relations, but it's terrible, don't even think of it as a career. <laughs> so you see that when we hit the era of Jimmy Hoffa, the Teamsters, et cetera, we get a real downturn in that. But like I said, now we're getting the upside of that now with Starbucks and Striketober, the unionization wave, seeing again how unions are working to get public opinion on their side to help them in their case. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, really potentially very powerful. The other thing that's a little frightening that's happening right now mm -hmm. is the fact that there are numerous union busting firms that are working right now. And if you take a look at their websites, a lot of them talk about the fact that they combine human relations, public relations, and security. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so you have the Pinkertons come back to life. Right. Um, well, of course, they've never left us. They're, they're still here. But you have this combination now where they are actively saying that they use public relations and they do it in a way that's the old corporate welfare company union type of approach. You don't need to join organized labor because we'll have a company union. We'll listen to you, we'll take care of you. We'll have an employee representation plan. We'll provide you with insurance. We'll provide you with elder care, child care. We'll provide you with everything you need all within the company. 
there's no need to go outside that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of thought that in fact, corporate welfare kind of died out in the 1930s because of the depression. And yet I would say it simply has taken different forms that when you go to work for a big tech company in California and they say, well, we, we provide dinner. You can have your you know, dinner prepared right here. We offer happy hours right here. It's all because then you can stay and work a few more hours afterwards. And it's that same kind of you know, corporate welfare system. Mm. And also deprives workers potentially of the opportunity to build connections outside of the context of the firm. Exactly. And so it's very much based on, I think, you know, American ethos of the American dream, individualism, that if we just support everybody working hard, you can get ahead. And so it is very much this um, capitalism, you know, is the answer to how you get ahead and how you're successful. And so big public relations firms like Hill and Knowlton, John Hill was a man by everybody's estimation, had a lot of integrity, but that integrity was very much geared toward protecting the capitalist system from socialism. And so a lot of this too relates to the Red Scare. Hmm. It relates to having to Americanize the immigrants as they come in so they understand the benefits of capitalism, et cetera. And so a lot of those public relations efforts were really educational, very much geared toward we have to educate people. And so you look in the National Association of Manufacturers Files, you see a lot of those educational films, those Uncle Abner says cartoons, et cetera, that they tried to use to educate people about the benefits of the American way. How were they attempting to sell uh, capitalism or free enterprise or the American way, as you say? Yeah, uh, the American Way was a big uh, NAM cam campaign, and that is exactly what it was called. And they had billboards and everything else, but it was all about how you could own your latest model of car, you could have all the best consumer goods, but only if you supported free enterprise, because free enterprise was the way of ensuring that we kept socialism out that we allowed talent to excel, that we had a meritocracy. Mm. And so trying to stave off at every turn any possible threat to this divine right to rule the private kingdom of a firm, either um, unions or public uh, opinion or uh, public regulation, at, at each turn they're attempting to, um, uh, to, to hold these forces at bay to retain that as you say, that I, I keep coming back to this phrase in my mind, this divine right to rule absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, in the late 1960s, uh, Sander Wayne Morse, kind of the maverick of the Sander, a progressive, he had been friends with uh, Robert La Follette, um, denounced Hill and Knowlton on the floor at the Senate mm -hmm. and said they were running their smoke machine because they were trying to get um, what they called labor law reform passed. Um, you had the Wagner Act back in 1935, which established rights for labor, the uh, Section 7, which allowed them to collectively bargain, et cetera. And then that gets overturned with the Taft-Hartley Act in the late 40s. But a lot of business didn't think the Taft-Hartley Act went far enough. And mm -hmm. so they worked with John Hill and Hill and Knowlton to try and get even stricter uh, regulations put on labor to where um, the Taft-Hartley Act said you couldn't have a closed shop, et cetera. But they wanted even more. They wanted to make sure that there was absolutely no way for organized labor to be involved. So Hill and Knowlton did a lot of work uh, campaigning for that. And a lot of it was very much kind of behind the veil. You know, you had to pull aside the curtain to see what the little man was doing in there. And so uh, they actually formed a group. It actually came out of the National Association of Manufacturers, and they originally called themselves the 12 Disciples or the No Name Committee. They went on to eventually kind of 
come out, be a little less secret and call themselves the labor law reform group, which made it sound you know, like they were doing something wonderful. But this was the head of GE. This was the head of many major groups. Uh, it involved the American Iron and Steel Institute of which the Hagley has all the records um, coming together to try and get uh, this labor law reform passed. And they ran articles in the major magazines. Uh, one of their biggest placements was actually an article in Reader's Digest. And I managed to get a hold of that issue. And there's the article which basically says, you know, we're, we're allowing the doors open to communist influences unless we can tighten up our labor laws. I wonder if your work has any implications for the present moment or the near future. I think there is a lot there. And I have to say, because I'm still having to tell folks in my field, public relations, that yes, labor is something we should be looking at, dealing with, that what I'm hoping with the book is to really open the door to other researchers. Hmm. I'm trying to kind of paint a broad history using specific instances to show, you know, case studies, how this played out, but to really open the door to other people taking it the next step. And I'm hoping that means that we'll get a lot more work looking at what's happening now, what's going on now. Well, that's just fascinating. And Patricia, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about your work. It's been really great. Well, thank you for having me today. Oh, you're very welcome. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger.